Hello everyone, this is James Nussbaumer, and um, this is kind of a different kind of a uh, session that I'm having here today. A woman from uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, by the name of Marla, in her late 30s, had contacted me and asked me to read from my book, The Master of Everything, a story of mankind and the world of illusion we call life. She seems to be a fan of mine, and, and what's really unusual about Marla is that she is a school teacher in uh, Tennessee and has one child, and she's in her late 30s, very similar to the age of my daughter, Erin, and it just for me, but she had been uh, uh, sending me messages on Facebook, and she was replying to some of my marketing that was going on, some uh, marketing campaigns that I'm doing to promote my book, books, I should say, and uh, she had questioned some of my marketing material, and, you know, she liked the fact that I said, don't, you know, advertise, don't market like the yellow pages, that's old stuff from years ago, and and she chuckled, and we went back and forth, and, and I, 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 I didn't get back to her on that I would make a video and read this certain chapter that she liked in the book, and, and she got back to me again and says, hey, uh, Jim, because I go by James Nussbaumer, but many of my friends that I get to know on Facebook end up calling me Jim, and that's really what my friends here locally call me, too. And so she said, uh, you know, you never said anything about reading that. And so I, I sent a message back to her saying, well, you know, you know, people can buy the book, and, um, you know, they'll read it, and it's, it's a chapter that would take awful long. Uh, it, it might be a long video to do this, I said to her, oh, why don't you just give it a try, and and I says, well, okay, and she brought up the fact, you know, she, she, she brought a quote out of the Innocent Man song that, written by Billy Joel, because she had saw in my book somewhere that I'm a Billy Joel fan, and she is a diehard Billy Joel fan herself, and that's really odd, because my daughter, Erin, who's also a school teacher, is also a Billy Joel fan, but only because I turned her on to Billy Joel in her years, in her earlier years. I took her to a few concerts when she was a young girl, and, and so her and her husband today, and you know, enjoy that, that type of music. Uh, so, but I thought that kind of odd and strange that, you know, it, it seemed like it was my daughter talking to me. Now, I never met this girl, Marla, just uh, chatting back and forth on Facebook. And all my friends on Facebook are, are sincere people. Uh, you know, I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook just in a year that I've been on Facebook. And it's just because of the way of my marketing and the way that I, you know, people say, uh, as far as marketing goes, uh, you know, um, marketing on Facebook. They don't like Facebook because uh, people like to talk about what they had for dinner last night and, you know, those kind of things. And people say, I don't want to hear what people had for dinner last night, you know, and, and all that. And, but so Facebook is a little different, a way of marketing. It's, you know, you know, I, if you see a lot of my ads out there, if you are a Facebook uh, follower of mine, you'll note that I'm like right to the point and, and, um, you know, I put my ad out there and say, hey, this is the way it is. And, and people want to know more, they message me and then we chat. And, and a lot of times I don't get back to people because I just don't have the time. But this particular girl, Marla, convinced me that I should go on and out of The Master of Everything, my first book, Master of Everything, the story of mankind, the world of illusion we call life, that I should read uh, most of chapter 15 which, uh, for, mo for those of you that don't know me, I wrote this book in prison. Uh, had it published by the time I walked out of prison, I was sentenced to prison for 10 years for a foolish securities violation as a financial advisor. And um, a, a judge who just had it in for me, and then that judge retired, and in my eighth year, a forgiving judge came forward, and my book had already been published, and more books to come and he saw what I was doing and the securities violation was very foolish, foolish on my part, but uh, for those of you that know me probably know that and that's all contained in this book too uh, about that and it's much of my experiences from prison. But where I'm getting at is that uh, just to give you a little bit of where we're going at with this, uh, this book, Marla, this in her late 30s school teacher asked me if I would read this chapter make a video out of it. 
So I said, well, I'll give it a good college try here and, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, speaking of marketing, to help market my book. And Marla, this is for you um, and for all of you that are listening to uh, the chapter 15 of the book is called Truth is Our Choice. Freedom can never be gained because you always have it. But it can be impossible for you to perceive this if you see your body as all that there is in being yourself. Your body is full of limits. If you look for freedom in a body, you are looking for it where it does not exist. The mind can be made free when it no longer identifies itself as a body, firmly tied to it and sheltered as though the body is the master. But identified with the body, we feel vulnerable to outside influences that dictate and try to rule us, leaving us feeling afraid to act without approval. Expecting more pain and fear in our lives will only allow the ego-based mind to take advantage of us by placing blame and becoming defensive. The ego's help will, can, will only keep us in the vicious circle we talked about earlier in this book, taking us on the ride of the merry-go-round, around and around as we try to figure out where to get off the insane roller coaster, the ups and downs. This keeps us always turning to the ego for peace and security as though we're constantly asking, when am I going to find it? The more we depend on the ego in this way, the more fearful we get. A Course in Miracles teaches us that the abilities we now possess are only shadows of our real strength. All of our present functions we make we make divided and open to question and doubt. If we don't realize our present abilities, such as our right-mindedness, we simply will not advance in anything we pursue. We must realize the opportunities we have in all areas of our lives, or at least realize the step that we're on now at this moment before we can move up to our real potential. The experience of prison has been a reality beyond anything I have ever known before. For me, it required learning a new way of merely being. That is, you know, who I really am in a violent environment. Many times, especially in the beginning, I would feel myself on the edge of panic, trying, to, trying in my mind to squeeze myself past the steel bars, screeching and screaming, often echoed all around me as I continued scolding myself. My own fearful muttering would sound as desperate as I felt. There came a point when I learned to get a grip on myself and quiet my mind and maintain a serene state of being. I became like a zombie much of the time. My mind started turning inward, and there was a definite force building inside me that was telling me, don't give up. Then my own voice would respond by saying to myself, I can't give up. I have no other place to go. A strength was building inside me like nothing I'd ever surrendered to before. You know, as I look back, I am convinced it was the Holy Spirit opening my eyes to a gift I've always had. About the best way I can explain this is to say that my inner journey felt as though I had discovered a wisdom. I continued to learn from it. It is a power that, that was new to me, and this wisdom seems as if it's finally freeing itself. Only my true self can tap into it, and the wisdom itself is called truth. The wisdom is very simple, and it tells me that anything not of truth is not real, and therefore must be illusory, made by the ego. You know, many times strength is thought to be built on these illusions and fears, but quite the opposite is true. It didn't take long to look fear square in the face when I realized that the prison I was sent to had a reputation for being a gladiator school. And that was no joke. Everywhere I seemed to be, be around, there were kids everywhere, young men. I called them kids, but they were barely out of high school. And many who had never attended high school, let alone graduated. And these young gangsters, literally members of gangs, stood out and they ruled the whole place. I stood out as well, and the few men of my age bracket were often called pops or old school or just plain school for short, and I was 50 years old when I entered prison. At this particular prison, 
the age of 50 was surely old school, and this pops age bracket was definitely a minority. But there were no senior privileges. Everyone and everything was fair game. The racial mix was 70% black and 30% white and Hispanic. The set, this set the stage for the gang warfare that was fought daily. Gangs were of a fraternal order that populated prisons all over the country and still do today. The unwritten rule at Belmont was that you fell into one of three categories. First were those who either owned, Belmont was the prison that I was at at the time, by the way, okay? First, uh, first were those who either owned or had under their chain of command other weaker inmates who had to earn their way to their level or beyond. Second were those, were those fighting their way up the ranks and were considered owned or ruled by another. Lastly, if neither of these appealed to you, your only option was that of an independent status. This option was called traveling alone or being solo, with no protection other than your own solo way of dealing with problems. The inmates like myself who traveled solo wanted no part in gang activity, gradually became aware of one another. We all learned to find out who each other were. One would be able to notice fellow independents who just wanted to be left alone, and it would take some time to prove your devoted independent status by not giving in to the gangs and their enticement tactics. Many independents, or those who walked solo, looked out for one another in certain ways and warned others of trouble ahead. An independent has few, if any, friends, and, and you're very cautious in trusting anyone. Each gang basically has its own gladiators who have many responsibilities, and one of those tasks might be to drag an independent into action somehow. This is usually some kind of a recruitment measure or threat to give you a sense of the importance of having protection. Only after a few to several bumps and bruises, if you're lucky, <laughs> if you're lucky, bumps and bruises, uh, if you're lucky and your own voice being heard strong enough, sometimes you gotta stand up, your own voice hurting strong enough, does the message get out that you are a waste of their time to just leave me alone? This pertains only to a certain degree, but a livable one. However, you are never totally out of the game. There always seems to be a test when you least expect it. On a bitter cold morning just after breakfast when I least expected having a problem, a show of illusory strength was displayed against me while I was walking the prison yard. A blow to the back of my head by a young gladiator slammed me straight down to the ground, and I didn't know what hit me. The next thing I remember is sitting on a gurney at the infirmary, having blood spattered, a blood spattered gash being stitched up. After 16 stitches in the back of my head and a bandaged head, I found myself in segregation, also known as the hole. I would spend 11 days in the hole wondering what the hell happened while an investigation was being launched. This was routine and basically uh, was meant to determine which gang I was tied to, if any. It was discovered that a young wannabe gladiator <clears throat> seeking membership into a well-known gang had used me as his prey for initiation. The gangs call this earning your bones for its new members. My thoughts dwelled on the cowardly action of the new gladiator. Unfortunately, much of the world understands strength as being outwardly physical, phys outwardly physically powerful and forceful. But when we have inner strength, we live from truth, don't we? In any situation, we have a choice to act from a position of truth or falsehood. If we choose truth, our true essence will be revealed and our decisions are made from our right mind. Our thinking will sprout from this. We will also see any obstacles from a right-minded point of view. 
<clears throat> During those 11 days in the hole, only a few weeks prior to my stumbling into A Course in Miracles, I felt as though a part of me was watching over my thoughts. I had experienced this watching over of my feelings and thoughts and decisions, even in my childhood, but now in prison and in the hole, I was trying to find my way through my, my own frustration and took this observer of my thoughts even deeper. There were no books, magazines in the hole, no radio in the hole, not even a Bible. The hole had a thin foam mattress on the concrete floor, a toilet in the corner, and a solid steel door with a slot near the bottom of the food, near, near the bottom, I'm sorry, near the, uh, near the bottom, toward the bottom side of the door for a food tray to slide through. Believe me when I say that this type of dark confinement can bring much that has been held inside to the surface. Excuse me. <clears throat> My inward thoughts focused on a world that invents terms and procedures it wishes to be true, usually for the sake of some form of gain, a world that believes it can create its own truths built on its own judgments. I found that if someone convinces me I am untruthful, be it morally or otherwise, he has denied me of my own truth. This then has me living according to his judgment of the way the world is to be. Well, still in shock at the mere fact of being in prison, because I was just new to prison when this happened, I also recognized my own illusions that led me to make decisions for material gain, and I rude the harm these, that this had caused me to cause others. On day six in the hole, I heard the sounds of change dragging along the concrete floor in the hallway outside the cell. The steel door to the cell next to me clanged open. I heard the chains being unlocked around the ankles of another inmate as the guard directed him to enter the cell. After a few hours, my new neighbor was shouting through his food slot to find company in me. I responded to his call. His name was Steve, a white man of 47 years old and, like me, a victim to a gladiator earning his bones. He'd been stabbed in the thigh with a shank by a young black man. He went on to tell me, he had just returned from an outside hospital stay, being treated for that stab wound, and would remain in the hole while an investigation was performed. Steve and I made some casual conversation through the food slot as he told me about his six-year prison term for burglary. He had only 10 months remaining and would go back to his job as an automobile canning, a job that he said that he loved. Steve was helpful to me regarding what I should expect from gang activity, as he was aware that I was just beginning my 10-year prison term. The fact in itself was con constantly haunting me of 10 years ahead of me, as was my concern about surviving the decades stretching before me with all these gladiators around me, with an ever-renewing population of more and more gladiators coming in week in and week out. Therefore, I eagerly digested Steve's information with an open eye toward my own survival. On day seven in the hole, the horror continued. I heard an outpouring of engaged, engaging shouts amongst others uh, in the, the cell block area outside my door and then there were some enraged shouts along with sounds of chains, and yet another inmate was dragged into the hole, thrown into the same cell. What was happening is the outpour of uh, noise from other cells, people were cheering on someone else being brought to the hole. The, <clears throat> the man that came to the hole was put into Steve's cell. It was quiet next door, and Steve would have a new cellmate, and he had no choice but to get acquainted with him. Alone in my cell, 
and I prayed that it would remain that way, I couldn't bear the thought of sharing that tiny hole with another prisoner who would possibly be a young gladiator who could stir up more trouble. A few hours later, I heard a strange and unusual crying for help, along with accelerated pounding, pounding like this on the steel door in the cell next to me. I recognized the voice as Steve's. The pounding and crying and choking continued, then slowed its pace and finally stopped. I could only hear the commotion due to the concrete wall separating the cells. I lowered myself to the floor, hoping to see a clue through the food slot. Realizing there was trouble, I screamed and screamed for help louder and louder through the food slot in the door. Three guards arrived after minutes of my shouting. I was out of breath from yelling and I was nervous and I was shaking. One of the guards opened the door and realizing an inmate was unconscious and bleeding from the head, he excitedly called for medics. I was looking out the food slot to the right of me seeing this going on. The hallway had many cells lined in a row, much like you would imagine that you see on television of death row. It was very similar to that. It's normally chaotic with insane, vulgar, animalistic sounds echoing off the block walls, a loud, ceaseless, hollow type sound, you know, kind of like coming from the bottom of a bucket. The, but that day, the hole grew silent. A guard snapped handcuffs onto the new inmate, pushing him into the, slapped, uh, put handcuffs onto Steve's, uh, the inmate that was with Steve. Through the food slot in the door, I witnessed this as I watched the young black man fall to the floor, only to be dragged away. My initial thoughts were that Steve was hurt bad. Within minutes, medical staff had arrived with a gurney. They spent several minutes in the cell. It was quiet and cold when the gurney left with Steve's body. His face was covered up with a sheet. Steve was dead. The dead man, Steve, age 47, who I, whom I never did actually meet face to face, but had talked, that had talked with through the food slot in our doors, had been beaten to death in cold blood by a 25-year-old youth. Rumors in the weeks ahead said that the incident was gang-related and racially motivated. Later, I would also discover that Steve was a high-ranking icon in a white supremacy gang. A contract had been put out on Steve's life, which does very often happen in gang wars. The two men should have never been in that same cell together in the hole. I was asked a few days later by prison officials to give a statement as to what I heard. However, based on the conversations I had with Steve prior to his death, I knew it was in my best interest not to make a statement. I'd also learned that a statement from me wouldn't have carried much weight anyways, being that I was also a prisoner. Five days later, after 12 days solo, I was released from the hole and declared not guilty of any foul play in the violent attack on myself that had sent me there to the hole. Any false strength we conjure up is nothing more than fear, masking around, masking, masquerading, I'm sorry, masquerading is something powerful. This is created by the ego desiring a gang membership uh, th this, this young youth, just his ego needed him in that gang. The young inmate desired a gang membership that only provided himself with a false identity that his ego needed is where I was trying to get to. He thought that he needed that in order to make himself feel strong. But in reality, this illusion only made him more fearful we get upset and angry at the world for not being fair, but we project that image and continue to contribute to its inequities. We are all starving for love that the world is afraid to give us. This brings us 
This brings on violent action as defense because we are so afraid of losing more love. Do you see how the ego creates a never-ending cycle of weakness? The ego believes it is all powerful until faced head on with the light, with the light we have radiating within us. But we often are afraid to let that light shine and, and let, it, let other people see our true self. The ego is afraid the light may shine into its hiding place, which is anchored in misconception. But upon this misconception of self, the world smiles with approval. It guarantees the pathways of the weak are safely kept, and those who walk on them will not escape, nor will they find right-mindedness, let alone eternity or one-minded true vision. Of course, I'm not blaming the world for my own mistakes caused by my own lack of vision, but I do know that the world cannot force its images on me any longer. I refuse to accept them. The time has come for me to see, to see exactly who and what I am connected to. I hope you, by now, see that you are beginning to know me and know your true self and know that we are connected as one. When the people of the world have earned their bones <laughs> to the point where they start questioning the world's false concepts, then truth will set them free to face the world without fear. A Course in Miracles wants us to learn that the illusory world's purpose is that we arrive without a self and the world helps to make us one as we go along. In other words, the world helps us since the day we're born to make a self of ourselves as we go along. So by the time we reach maturity, we have perfected it to meet the world on equal terms seeing truth as we see fit. This was so with the prison, prison officials at Belmont Prison when they decided that the truth would be that Steve's death was accident related. Thank you everyone. James Nussbaumer, the author of The Master of Everything. God bless and have a good evening.